welcome to my talk. I'm going to be presenting a summary of my last three years of work for my PhD. And as you can see, the topic is integrated ambulance and ambulance crew scheduling. Today, I want to give a brief overview of what the context of this problem is and then go through the research aims and the research plan for this problem. There are three models that I'll be discussing today, starting with a static model, a dynamic model, and then at the end, there is a reactive real-time model, which I'll briefly introduce. Um, I'll go through some of the results and the solution approaches for the static and dynamic models as well. And then at the end, just some of the implications and future work for this, for this problem. Okay, so what do I mean when I'm talking about ambulance scheduling? Well, Basically, this is just all the different movements that ambulances can make during a shift, whether that's responding to an incident or whether that's relocating to a different ambulance station so that the whole system can be better prepared for future incidents as they come along. I've got a little example here that I'm hoping will give you a, a taste of the number of decisions that have to be made with this type of problem. This is only a very simple example where we've got three available ambulances and in the first panel, two calls have come in for ambulance services. And each of those can use a subset of all of the available ambulances. And for these specific ones, they are required to go to a specific hospital. The decision that we can make is to send the closest ambulance for each incident. And that is a common decision that's made. In the second panel, we can see the results of that decision and what occurs as a third incident is called in. So one of the incidents has already received a response. That ambulance is now no longer available to respond to any new incidents. But the second one that's still on its way, it can continue to the incident it's already assigned to. Or if the new incident is a higher priority, we can divert that ambulance to go to the new incident. The other option is to send the third available ambulance either to the new incident or reassign the second one that's still waiting for its ambulance, we can send that third ambulance to that one instead. The decision that's made in this toy example is to divert the ambulance that was on its way to the high priority incident and then send the third ambulance to the waiting incident. In the third panel, we can see that we've cleared a lot of the decisions but we've still got a few decisions that are left to be made. For example, which hospital are we going to send this incident to? Because sometimes there is a choice. And there's also the decision at the end, this third ambulance, are we going to leave it at an ambulance station near the hospital when it finishes its job? Or are we going to relocate it back to its original ambulance station at the end? You might already have worked out that there is a decision we could have made earlier that might have made the whole system more effective. If we'd relocated an ambulance in the first panel to be somewhere else, when the third one came along, we may not have had to divert ambulances and then send one from further away to an incident they've been waiting for a while. So that's just an example. And the reason that this is important is because making good decisions leads to better response times. And in the context of ambulances, Response times are directly linked to patient outcomes, so we want to make the best possible decisions. The second part of my problem talks about ambulance crew scheduling. This is your longer term planning that involves trying to place ambulance crew on a feasible set of shifts. And there are some rules that we have to obey with this problem that are from workplace agreements. So there's a minimum fatigue break between the last time an ambulance crew worked and the next time that they can be scheduled to work. I have a maximum of four shifts per week. There's also a limit on the number of sequential night shifts that you can have. So if you're working the midnight shift on Monday and the midnight shift on Tuesday, your next shift is not allowed to be the midnight shift on Wednesday. Um, there's also a, requir a requirement to have a minimum of two rostered days off each week. For my model, I am treating that as a 48-hour period of two rostered days off. There are also meal breaks and rest breaks that are required each shift. These can be interrupted, but it's not desirable to interrupt them, and it's preferred that they have 
the recommended duration and also within a specific time window if possible. Okay, so the research aims for my problem. I'm trying to integrate ambulance scheduling and ambulance crew scheduling into a single stage model. Previous approaches in the literature have looked at ambulance dispatching and relocation as a single model or have looked at trying to create an ambulance crew schedule as part of a two-stage process where one model will work out the number of ambulances you need per hour and then the second model will create the shift. My approach is different, it's a bit more direct and I'm trying to create a single model that will do both so that feedback from the ambulance shift schedules can help you decide which to dispatch and your dispatching requirements can help feed into what your schedule for the crew should be. To do this, I'm looking at using a job shop scheduling approach. So I'm going to investigate what benefits we get out of using this approach. The outcome should include a strategic planning tool for shift scheduling and also a reactive decision aid that can be used in real time to help with dispatching and relocation decisions. Because these models are quite complex and difficult to solve, Another one of the research aims is to develop and test some new solution algorithms for these type of problems. So the research plan, of course the first thing I did was conduct a literature review and this included a survey on mathematical models that have been applied in the ambulance area, applications of job shop scheduling in, and also what sort of heuristics have been used as solution techniques for these type of problems. I then need to formulate three types of mathematical model. Each is more complicated than the previous. The first one is a static model that can be solved strategically. And this is kind of a test case to show that the single stage model as a theory actually works in practice, that we can include some of these crew scheduling rules into the ambulance scheduling model. The second model is a dynamic model, which includes more realistic constraints and better represents the system and that can be used to build up shift schedules. The third one that I have formulated is a reactive real-time model and that one is designed to take real-time information, place it into the model to, and try and solve it to get good decisions on dispatching and relocation. There will be appropriate metaheuristic solution techniques that I can then use to solve the static and dynamic models with a case study. And that case study is based on real data. And then there is some sensitivity analysis that needs to be performed on the results from the heuristics for the static and dynamic models. OK, so I'll start by talking about the static model. And I've mentioned job shop scheduling and flexible flow shop scheduling. So, <laughs> Just to give you a taste of how they're relevant to this problem, the ambulance problem can be modelled using these techniques by considering, considering each ambulance as a machine that has to process a set of jobs, which in this case are the incidents. And each of these jobs has a set number of tasks that have to occur. For the static model, these are travelling to the scene of an incident, actually treating the patient at the scene of an incident, Travelling to a hospital if hospital transfer is required. The time it takes to actually admit the patient into a hospital. And then travelling back to an ambulance station. This is um, a flexible model rather than just a normal job shop model because there's multiple types of ambulance vehicles that can handle... So each job can be handled by multiple ambulances and also the ambulances handle all the different tasks available. So it's flexible for that reason. Because these operations for each incident occur in the same order, that's what makes this a flow shop problem rather than a job shop problem. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail about those though. Um, a key thing to note with this static model is that it, it is a simplification. And the main simplification with this one is that we are returning ambulances back to their home ambulance station after every incident. That's not quite realistic as incidents can be sent from their last known location, 
but this allows us to make sure that ambulances are always at the home ambulance station when they finish each shift so we can so that we can consider things such as overtime a few other things in this model are that incidents have response time windows rather than trying to minimize response times i'm forcing them to be within certain limits so I want to have, say, 90% of emergency incidents should be met within my first response time window, and then 100% should be met within a second response time window. Incidents can also have a preference for the different type of ambulances, and also a preference for different hospitals. The crew schedule the crew scheduling rule that I'm including in the static model as a test to show that the idea is solid is the fatigue break to start off with, and other ones will be introduced in later models. The objective of this one is to try and minimize the costs of the ambulance services by minimizing the number of shifts to which ambulances are assigned, and then, if we can, minimize overtime as well. I want to go through a few of the more important variables and constraints of this static model. This isn't all of the variables, but they are the ones that are most relevant for this talk today. The first three are binary decision variables that determine the assignments in the model. The first one tells you which ambulance is assigned to each incident and which shift that dispatch having started during. The second one plans the path that an ambulance travels when responding to an incident. So you start at an ambulance station, you travel to the scene of the incident, you travel to a hospital and then back to the ambulance station. And that variable is necessary to make sure we're using the correct travel times and we're going back to the correct station for ambulances. The third variable actually builds up the shift schedule. That tells you which station ambulances were assigned to and on which shift they were working. I also have three timing decision variables. These tell you what time each incident had a dispatch starting, what time the ambulance arrived at the scene of the incident, and what time the incident was cleared so that the ambulance could then go on to another incident. The dispatch time and the clear time are important because we need to use those to make sure that each ambulance is only handling one incident at a time. We don't have quantum ambulances that can be in two places or can handle two things. It doesn't work like that. The arrival time variable is also pretty important because this is how we make sure that the response times are within our time windows. And this is how we constrain the incident responses through tardiness. Overtime is also a variable in this model and we place that in the objective as well. So we're trying to minimize ambulance shifts and ambulance overtime. There are a set of constraints that are necessary to be applied to these variables. The first of which are your precedence constraints. These do things such as saying an ambulance can't be sent to an incident until that call about the incident has come in. They also make sure that you don't arrive earlier than you were dispatched and you don't complete the incident earlier than you were dispatched or arrive on scene. And you have to make sure that the correct amount of travel time and processing time has occurred. We also have a set of disjunctive constraints. These are the ones that make sure there aren't any overlapping incidents on the same ambulance. Tardy response constraints make sure that response times meet our response time windows. Overtime constraints are there to calculate, well, to, to determine the variable, sorry, to determine the value that the overtime variable can have. This also prevents ambulances being continually sent to a bunch of incidents after their shift has ended. The crew scheduling rules in constraints are the fatigue breaks. And these are implemented by saying, if you work shift X, you're then not allowed to work the next shift or the one after that if there is not enough time between the shifts to give you your minimum eight hours off. 
Resource suitability constraints, just make sure that if you request a specific type of ambulance, you are going to get an ambulance that is able to meet your requirements. And if you need to go to a specific hospital, you are going to go to that hospital. I've also added symmetry breaking constraints in, into this model to try and reduce the solution space and make it easier to solve. These are necessary because I can have identical ambulances and it might be possible to send both of these to a particular incident and get the same result, but that duplicates the number of solutions that I have. I want to make sure I'm only picking one whenever that situation arises. I want to talk about the dynamic model now, and this is a lot more interesting than the static model because I'm relaxing the constraint that you have to return back to the ambulance station after every incident. It's a lot more realistic, and I'm also including more of the crew scheduling constraints. So ambulances can now be dispatched from the last location they were at, and we allow relocation to occur as well. So we can have an ambulance at station five, but after it's had an incident, we may want it to wait at station three instead because that's better prepared overall. However, this introduces the problem of what happens when we need to end a shift. We want to make sure that the people working on the ambulance finish at their home ambulance station. So I had to introduce these return to station jobs into the model and apply a few constraints onto them to make sure that they always occur as the last job on each shift. In terms of the, in terms of the crew scheduling rules, I'm now placing the limit on the consecutive number of night shifts, the limit on the number of shifts per week, and enforcing one period of two days off in a row to occur per week. This model has also been formulated as a rolling horizon, which means instead of having to solve all of my incidents at once with data from, with historical data that I'm then trying to work out how we could have dealt with that, I can now solve, instead of a week, solve a day and then solve another day and solve another day with information from the previous horizons informing the later horizons. These diagrams actually show some of the disjunctive arcs. So if, if you don't like them, that, that's okay. They are a bit more technical. Um, each of the solid lines represents a strict precedence that must occur. So the first diagram here, I've got three incidents in this, in this sample problem, each of which I've broken out into four different tasks. The second one, the middle one, actually has a choice of two hospitals, but we can only select one. Wherever there's a solid line, that tells you that the next task has to occur after the one it's connected to. The dotted lines tell you that these two tasks can be sequenced on the same ambulance and it is possible to have one after the other, but you don't necessarily have to choose to have it that way. In the second diagram, this is trying to show you when the relocations are allowed to occur. So I've condensed all the different tasks that occur in an incident just to one circle per incident. And we started an ambulance station. We can have a relocation immediately if we need to or we can go to an incident straight away. Relocations can occur any time before or after we go to an incident, but if you're already responding to, a, to, to get to a patient, you can't perform a relocation then because you're doing something more important. The third diagram is just a summary that is an example feasible schedule that shows that you can schedule incident one and incident two with the correct order of operations on the same ambulance and you can have a relocation first and a relocation at the end if you like. And the third incident is scheduled on a different ambulance, possibly because it didn't fit on the same ambulance within the response time windows. And again, we can have relocations or not. Okay, so <laughs> The dynamic model 
has a lot more parameters and variables than the static model. And I, I do mean a lot. So I've only shown a small sample of those here. With the parameters, there are a set of jobs. For the static model, that was purely the incidents that ambulances had to respond to. Now I'm including all potential relocation jobs and all potential jobs returning ambulances to their home stations. Not all of these are going to be selected though, because when I initialize the model, I haven't yet decided what the home station of ambulances are. So there's going to be a couple of additional potential return to station jobs, and I'm only going to be selecting one per ambulance per shift to which it's rostered. In terms of the variables, I actually have two disjunctive variables in the dyna dynamic model. And the first one, this has information on which ambulance two incidents were assigned to, which shift they were assigned to. And if that's the same, it will tell you which one occurred first. What it doesn't tell you is how many jobs occurred in between those two ones. So if one occurred first, the other might be the very next one, or there might be two or three jobs in between. So I've got a second disjunctive variable that doesn't contain information on the ambulance or shift, but if two jobs are on the same ambulance and shift, it will equal one only if job I is immediately before job A. Now these are dependent on each other, but I've kept them as two separate, as two separate variables because that allows some of the constraints in my model to be linear and makes the model easier to solve as a result. Okay, I've also got the timing variables and at this point I should probably mention what T means in my dynamic model. It's formulated as a rolling horizon. So T is actually the time at which the horizon starts. So if you're starting and you're just doing one horizon, T would just be zero. If you've got a horizon that solved daily, the first horizon would have t equals zero, and the next one would have t equals 24 hours or minutes or whatever. I still have the dispatch time, the arrival time, and the clear time as in the static model, but I've also introduced the time when an ambulance begins travel to a hospital and the time at which it arrives at the hospital. And this is useful because if the job crosses over between two horizons. If you're traveling to a hospital in one horizon but haven't yet reached there by the time of the next and you have more information, maybe you've found out that your expected time at the hospital is going to be a lot longer than you previously thought, you can change these variables and update which hospital you're going to. I also have a couple of location variables. These are similar to the dispatching time and the clear time variables, but instead of saying when it occurs, this is saying where it occurs. So we know from which location we dispatched an ambulance and where it was at the end. And this is important for our travel time considerations. Okay, a few constraints. Because of the rolling horizon, I need to enforce some sort of continuity between the horizons. If something has already occurred by the time we start the horizon, but the job's not yet complete, maybe we've arrived at the scene, but we haven't yet gone to hospital, we can't change the time that we arrived on scene. That's got to stay the same. And any decisions about going to the hospital can't occur earlier than the time at which we make the decision. So these continuity constraints, there's a set of those that make sure that happens. I also need to have additional disjunctive constraints for my new disjunctive variable. This relates the two of them together. So if job J has any jobs at all occurring prior to it on the same ambulance and shift, there must be exactly one immediate predecessor. This is just one of the constraints that enforces that. There's about three of them that are necessary. I also have to make sure that my return to station jobs are the ones that occur at the end of each shift. And there's a really neat way of doing this with the scheduling approach. I can use the disjunctive variables 
to force the last job on each ambulance and shift to be from the set of return to station jobs. And that's actually one of the benefits of having this flexible flow shop approach and using job shop scheduling techniques. I've also got location constraints, and these use my other disjunctive variable. These just make sure that an ambulance is dispatched from the completion location of the previous job if there was one, or it will be the ambulance station that the ambulance started at if there weren't any jobs before. Other constraints which I haven't shown here are the new shift scheduling rules. They also have their constraints. And there are constraints affecting the status of each incident because it's important in this model to know what stage of the response we are at, if we've arrived on scene, if we've arrived at a hospital, that kind of thing. Okay, so I've formulated these two models. I now have to try and solve them. So I've got a case study that's based on real data but I've simplified it so that I can get my results in a reasonable amount of time to actually test these models. I'm using one week of data, and I'm only looking at the Brisbane CBD and Inner North region. Um, that picture may not have come up quite as well as I have hoped, but <laughs> what I'd like you to see is that there's a couple of hotspots in the area, there's a lot of demand in the inner city region where there's a lot of people passing through. And there's also a second hotspot that occurs near a major hospital at Chermside. This is not actually unexpected because the ambulance incidents includes emergency ones, urgent ones, non-urgent ones, and a subset of those actually includes patient transport as well, which ambulance services can provide. So I'm making sure that there's enough ambulances to meet all of those different types of incidents. To test these models initially, I've also simplified the possible shift patterns into three 10-hour shifts per day. This is able to meet, sorry, this is able to meet a full 24-hour period without any gaps and also has an overlap in the middle of the day when demand is higher. Having fewer shifts to start off with reduces the number of decision variables in my model, so I'm able to solve... It's a smaller problem that I'm able to solve faster. Okay, so the solution approach. For the static model, initially I looked at trying to find exact solutions using CFLEX and then compared that against a couple of heuristic algorithms that I developed. For the dynamic model, it's more complex than the static one. So I needed to have more complex heuristics to see if I could improve my results further. So I've got constructive heuristics, hybrid tabby search and constructive heuristics, an ant colony optimization, and a hybrid ant colony optimization, optimization and constructive heuristic, which I will explain in a bit. For the dynamic model, I also tested three different horizon lengths to see if that affects the quality of the solutions as well. The first and the simplest of my solution algorithms is the constructive heuristic. This one assigns ambulances to incidents in the order in which they arrive. Rather than, and, okay, and rather than having all of the possible ambulances in a pool available at the start, I'm trying to reduce the amount of memory by only introducing ambulances as they become required. The benefits of this is that it is fast. Depending on the size of the problem, I can get a solution in seconds or minutes. And it's constructed in such a way that I will get a feasible solution out of it. The disadvantage is that that feasible solution might not be the optimal solution. Just briefly how this works, for each incident as we try to, assi try to assign ambulances to it, we tr first identify if there are any existing ambulances that are possible to assign this incident to if it, and what shifts and any jobs already assigned that we can place this new one either before or after. So we have a set of possible positions that we can sequence this job in. Those options are then sorted by the response time. 
as earlier response times are generally better. And I test those in order until I find one that is feasible with, with respect to my tardiness requirements and also make sure it doesn't overlap with any incidents assigned previously. If I can't find any feasible paths on existing ambulances, that's when I introduce a new one to make sure that incident gets a response. The problem with the constructive heuristic that I'm trying to address with my hybrid heuristics is that once you've assigned an incident onto an ambulance, that restricts the options that you have available for any future incidents. And assigning them in the order they arrive means that you might not necessarily be assigning the ones that have the most strict requirements first. So I'm using a tabby search heuristic to try and vary the order in which incidents are assigned to ambulances. How tabby search works is that you have an initial solution and you're exploring a neighbourhood of solutions around that. You then select the best solution from that neighbourhood and then test the neighbourhood of solutions around that one. Cycling of solutions is prevented because we keep in memory a list of all the moves that we've previously selected. So over time you're exploring more of the solution space and hopefully finding better solutions. The neighbourhood for my model though is I'm only allowing single swaps of incidents, incident positions each time. So if I've got incidents in order of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the neighbourhood might include 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, but only small swaps each time. This means that when you've got a large number of incidents, there can be really large neighbourhoods and it can take a while to go through them. So rather than searching the entire neighbourhood each time, I'm trying to find a promising section of that neighbourhood to sample first. So I've introduced this smart swap procedure to try and identify which swaps are more likely to yield promising results. And I do that by trying to find incidents which contribute to overtime or a tardy, those kind of ones, and I'll select those first. Okay. I'll move on to the next solution approach now. This is the ant colony optimization. Um, this one here is based on the way that ants try and find good food sources by placing pheromone on their trails to signal to ants coming later that there's something good at the end of this path. The paths are all the different decisions that can be made. So a decision on placing an incident in a certain position and sequencing it perhaps earlier than you otherwise would have. But we can also place pheromone on decisions such as which ambulance station do we assign this ambulance to? Is it a good decision to place job J on the same ambulance as job I? We can, we can also use that as one of our decision arcs. The benefits of this approach are that I can construct solutions and explore a larger section of the solution space without having to resort to that constructive heuristic previously. The disadvantage is that it requires a large amount of memory to keep track of this pheromone on all of these decision arcs. And the more types of decision I'm trying to optimise with this method, the more parameters there are in the model that I'm going to have to tune. The process model for this one has a few things I'd like to point out. Um, firstly, the pheromone itself doesn't update after each solution I've found because that could mean I'm converging to a solution too early, so it only updates after about n solutions. It does follow a similar approach to the constructive heuristic. What I do is I'm still assigning each incident one at a time but I'm not selecting the next one in order. I've got a, the next in position to sequence and it could be any of the incidents. They each have a different probability based on an external parameter such as what their due time is as well as information of which ones we have assigned in that position previously to good success. So once I've selected an incident, I then have to identify all the possible paths. So which ambulances, which shift, 
which jobs are good to place in the same ambulance, which should be first, those kind of decisions. There's a probability assigned to each of those paths, and I use the Ant Conley optimization to select one of those paths to trial. If it meets my tidiness and no, no overlapping requirements, it will be accepted. Otherwise, I'll select another path based on the updated probabilities. When I run out of paths, that's when new ambulances are introduced into the model. To try and get around the fact that that requires a lot of memory, I did consider creating a hybrid ant colony optimization with the constructive heuristic. And this is hoped to be an improvement over the tabby search and constructive heuristic because instead of having a single swap each time, I'm allowed to jumble the position of incidents a lot more. So I'm exploring the solution space a lot faster. A possible disadvantage, which I would like to explore a bit more, is that I may miss an improving solution that is only swapping two jobs that a tabby search might have picked up. So one of the things for future work that I've identified is to try and create a hyper heuristic that has ant colony optimization and then uses tabby search to refine it at the end. So that's something I'm interested in doing. Um, where the tabby searched explored neighborhoods, this one uses the pheromone to try and work out the best order in which to sequence your incidents. And then it, again, it assigns them one at a time and updates your pheromone after about every n iterations. I don't know if I've got enough time to go through the details of this, but I am happy to answer questions at, at the end about the ant colony optimization. So there, there is information there if you have questions. I want to get on to the results from the model as these are what some people, some people will find most interesting. Here I've compared the number of ambulances actually scheduled from real data against what against the results from my two models, the static model and the dynamic model. Now, I did expect the static model to overestimate the number of ambulances <laughs> needed because it had that requirement to always return to your ambulance station. So there was extra time spent traveling when you could have spent returning, sorry, when you could have spent responding to incidents. So the fact that that one uses more ambulances is not unsurprising. With the dynamic one, though, again, it's using more ambulances, not as many as the static model. But if you look at the second table, there is evidence that both the static and dynamic models reduce response times. And not just for emergency incidents, but for all incidents as well. This tells me that these models, rather than trying to minimize response time with your resources, you can set a response time target that you want to meet and work out what resources are required to meet that. The fact that my models recommend increasing resources to reduce response time is actually a good way of verifying that the model is doing something right as well, because it's well known that if you add more ambulances, you're going to reduce the response times. If I'd got a different result, that <laughs> increasing ambulances increase response times, that would be bad but I've got something that is expected, so that's quite good. Another thing to note is that the dynamic model outperforms the static model on all of the measures. It reduces the number of ambulances that we need. It reduces the amount of overtime, and it reduces the response time. So this shows that it is important to have a model that allows relocations. I, these are some of the shift schedules that I got for the dynamic model. I'll just briefly explain the three types of ambulances. This was a simplification where there's three types of ambulances in the model. Type 1 are your mo most expensive ones, but they are able to respond to a wider variety of incidents. Type 2 and type 3, less expensive, but also less capable or less equipped. The second graph shows the number of ambulances available at each hour of the day in the results from my model. So it actually shows that you've got the daily peak and the daily drop that matches with the demand levels. A couple of other things. 
I've got majority of type 1 ambulances. So if there's any way to have more flexible ambulances in your fleet, that would be the way to go. Um, I also found that some of my ambulance stations had more ambulances allocated at them than others. In particular, I think Chermside was one of them. And we see this in real data that some ambulances are busy, some stations are busier than others. And the fact that this was reflected in my data as well is also verification that the model, our model is doing something right. Okay, I'm going to skip over a few of things because I might be running low on time and I want to get to the sensitivity analysis. This is for the static model and actually compares the results for the exact solver, the constructive heuristic, and the hybrid heuristic that was used to solve this one. What I found was that the exact solver was able to get exact solutions only for very small problems with maybe five or ten incidents. After that, it reached a time limit that I'd set and was able to get solutions but not show that they were optimal. After about 50 incidents, it wasn't able to get any solutions within that time limit at all. This is evidence that we do need some sort of heuristic to solve them particularly for the reactive model, that is also something I intend to do, where we want solutions in real time. Evidence that the hybrid taboo search and constructive heuristic is good is that for the small problem size with five incidents, it is able to find the optimal solution compared with the solution from CPLEX, which we know to be exact. Um, after about... 35 incidents in your problem, it starts to outperform the solutions we were getting from CPLEX because CPLEX required so much more time to get the solutions there. And we were also able to find solutions from the constructive heuristic and the hybrid heuristic for problem sizes that CPLEX couldn't handle because it just, it, it had a hissy fit, it didn't like the amount of memory, it, did, it just didn't like me, I don't know. But the, the heuristics are able to solve weekly problems where an exact solver cannot. Okay, for the dynamic model, I tested a wider variety of heuristics because it is a more interesting model. It should be well tested. I tried to solve the model exactly for five incidents and that took... How many days did that take to do? A lot. But I was able to show that an exact solution for five incidents can be found and that all of the hybrid heuristics I tested were able to find that solution. You might notice here that I've got three different heuristics for the hybrid ant colony and constructive heuristic. This is because this is a really promising heuristic and I wanted to test different parameters to see what effect that had on my final solutions. I found that for small size problems, the ant colony optimization and the hybrid heuristic had the best average solutions. And as I increased the problem, again, the ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic was good for about 20 incidents. Increasing the problem size further, and I start to see there are some benefits from the tabby search as well. And the third ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic starts to outperform the ones with the, that were performing better, the smaller problem sizes. Which leads me to think that it may be beneficial to try and have a hybrid heuristic that is able to vary the parameters with the problem size. And that's something else that I've flagged for future work. The diagram down the bottom there, the graph, that just shows the moving average of solutions from the ant colony heuristic to show that we are able to get converging solutions in about 1,000 seconds of CPU time, which is what I've used for some of my solution limits. OK, horizon length. This is where I've got a week's worth of data and tried to solve it with all of my different heuristics. The best results that I found were from the ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic with the third set of parameters for daily horizons. 
And I find it interesting that daily horizons were the best. Uh, possible reasons for this are that the weekly horizon, it had a lot of jobs that you had to consider at once. And so building the solution each time was a bit more difficult, took a bit longer. And so it was harder to find the good solutions and test a lot of different options, simply due to the sheer number of possibilities. The hourly horizons only had a, on average 20 jobs to be assigned each time. But because I had the same overall amount of time for each model, so I used, what is it? I haven't actually written it there, unfortunately. I think it was eight hours was allocated to solving the total weekly problem. But when I have the hourly horizons, there's 168 of them. So to make sure it's not running for 168 times as long as the other models, the amount of time given to solve each horizon was a lot less. So possibly it didn't have enough time to converge. Or it could be that the ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic and tabu search do perform better with problem sizes of about 200 incidents because that was the one in my analysis on the previous slide where those two heuristics were performing better. So this is another case where it might, might be a good idea to have the hybrid ant colony heuristic that can vary the parameters depending on the problem size. Um, I just want to quickly go through the effect of including overtime in the objective function because this was something novel that I was able to include in my problems. I was able to do this because of the way that the disjunctive constraints were formulated with return to station jobs, but I wanted to make sure that by including it, I wasn't having a detrimental effect on the number of ambulances that I was assigning each shift. So just with this analysis here for the dynamic model, it shows that there's not actually a lot of difference if the objective weights include overtime or if they don't. So that, that's actually a pretty good solution. It could possibly, because the heuristics are constructed in such a way that they'll minimize overtime even without that in the objective, that's something that does possibly require further analysis. Um, Okay, so getting on to the third model. This is the real-time reactive model. And the hypothesis for this is that a reactive model that integrates scheduling and shift scheduling of ambulance services can be solved using heuristic techniques such that a good solution is provided in real time. And it's that real-time bit that's important. This model needs to take in real-time information about the location and the status of ambulances and incident data as it comes in in real time and be able to solve a model quickly enough that it can provide information on dispatching advice and relocation advice so that it's useful. A few other extensions to this model from the dynamic model are that I'm now trying to include meal breaks in the schedule. So I'm trying to work out not just which ambulances do I dispatch and when do I relocate, but is there a good place to put these meal breaks so that they do occur and they're not being as interrupted as often as they otherwise would? This model has a multi-criteria objective function that's designed to minimize tardiness, minimize coverage gaps over time and missed breaks where possible. Coverage is now necessary in this one because where previously I had a case study of data that I had in advance, this one needs real-time information and does, doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. So we make predictions of the number of ambulances that should be in each area so that there's not a gap that can't, there's not a gap where an incident arri arising there won't be able to have any ambulance at all arrive within a set time limit. Um, moving on. This model, as I mentioned, it needs to have real-time information on ambulance state and location and real-time incident data. 
So using the case study that I used to solve the static and the dynamic models isn't really apt for this one here. It should be solved at certain trigger events. Every time in a new incident arrives, we need to solve the model so we know which ambulance is a, so we can make a recommendation about which ambulance to send. It can also be resolved at time intervals to take account of updates and information such as traffic conditions might have changed your expected travelling time. So you might want to resolve the, the model as a result of that. The constructive heuristic and the hybrid ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic are also proposed as methods of solving this model with a few tweaks. The proposed output should be recommendations for dispatching decisions, relocation decisions, and when we should schedule breaks. I've also proposed a couple of questions that can be used to analyse results from this model. Okay, implications from this research. Firstly, I have formulated three models. The dynamic model is probably the best that can be, to be used as a strategic planning tool because we've shown we can get good response times from solving this model. The formulation for the reactive real-time model can be used as a tactical decision tool, although it does need some real-time data to actually be tested before implementation. I have shown that it is possible to have a single stage model that includes ambulance scheduling and ambulance crew scheduling, and it can be solved using these flexible flow shop scheduling techniques. The benefits are that I can ha use the disjunctive constraints to keep track of ambulance locations and make sure ambulances return to their station at the end of the shift, so that overtime can be considered. And I've shown that overtime Minimising overtime doesn't seem to have any bad effect on minimising the total number of ambulances. I've also proposed a couple of new solution heuristics, the most promising of which are the hybrid tabby search and constructive heuristic with smart swaps, and also the hybrid ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic. A couple of directions for further work. With the mathematical models, I'd like to test them with an increased number of shifts because this would allow us to explore more flexible shift schedules, which is a little bit more realistic, and we may be able to reduce the number of ambulances further. The case study that was used to solve them, we should also extend the... We should also... <laughs> sorry. We should also try and solve these models with other real-life data as well, so we're not relying on a single case study and that needs to be done before implementation. I'd also like to integrate the scheduling model with real-time routing information. That would improve the estimation of travel times in the model, and it would make our results more accurate. In terms of the heuristics, I've already mentioned these, but I'd just like to reiterate. I'd like to, I think it would be valuable to allow the ant colony optimization and constructive heuristic to be allowed to vary its parameters depending on the size of the problem to see if we can improve the output. And I like the idea of creating a hyper heuristic where we have our ant colony optimization to initially decide the, the sequence in which incidents are assigned, but then refine that with a taboo search and keep a constructive heuristic in that method as well to rebuild the solutions. Um, that's pretty much what I have. There are a few outcomes from this work. There are two journal articles that have been submitted to quality journals, one of which is for a special edition on scheduling applications. And there have also been three conference presentations as well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.